As Christadelphians, we're very unique amongst the Christian community, is that we read the whole Bible as the mind of God revealed to us. And we sit here in the 21st century to talk about today events that took place two and a half thousand years ago, events that took place in a small, conquered, destroyed and feeble nation that was struggling to recreate itself after captivity. And we find relevance in those, those events. Out there in the world, people would hardly know that these things ever happened. They wouldn't take any notice if they did know. You won't find these in any secular history book. And yet we read these words with great interest. Because God caused these things to be written for our learning and admonition. Upon whom the end of the ages is come. So we read the whole Bible with avid interest because inspiration and direction are there for those who have eyes to see. Now, this restoration era, that is the return from captivity, is a period of history that God was incredibly focused on. We find that this period actually overlaps with the last prophecies of Daniel, who saw the decree of Cyrus, probably was instrumental in making it happen. It overlaps with Second Chronicles right at the end. It concludes the books of Nehemiah, Ezra, Esther, Malachi, Haggai, Zechariah, in a hundred-year window from B.C. 540 to 440. There is an incredible amount of divine revelation in this hundred-year period. It's highlighted when you compare it to what happened in the next 400 years of Israel's history. From the time that the sun went down on the prophets, the famine of the word of Yahweh came into being. And for 400 years, there was no voice of God just a little help to the Maccabees, but no voice of God for 400 years, which makes this last period of revelation in the Old Testament so critical to us. It was a time of rebuilding the temple and the walls of the city, but it was a challenging time. And God's interest was not in walls, not in temples, not in stones. It was in the spirit of the builders, Think of the stirring challenges we find in this period of history. Consider your ways, said Haggai. Let us rise up and build, said Nehemiah. And we note especially God's challenge in the prophecy of Zechariah, which comes right down to us today, brethren and sisters. Who hath despised the day of small things? Never let us think that what we do is insignificant in the sight of God. There was never a time in Israel's histories where angels were so active, overtly and covertly, to support the work of rebuilding. Nowhere else do you find such inspiring visions as you do through Daniel and Ezra, Nehemiah and Zechariah and Haggai. And there are great lessons for us because we also live in the day of small things and the end of the age. And we are a small religion compared to most others. Everywhere spoken against inside Christianity because of our rejection of their fables. We will be increasingly reviled by the postmodern world because we say there is only one truth and there's only one morality that matters. And we're living in tough times trying to shape living stones for the house of the glory of God. And so we come to Ezra in this last study because this is what we need to do from here on. We need to become Ezra. A man whose name means the helper. He brought to Israel the greatest help possible, education in divine thinking. He was not a builder like Zerubbabel or Joshua. He did not lay a single stone. He was not a dynamic, inspiring leader like Nehemiah was or a great organizer like Nehemiah was. He was not a prophet like Haggai and Zechariah were. What he built was the most important thing of all, spiritual thinking. And he got that from Ezekiel. But he was more than that, brethren and sisters. He was more than a great teacher. He was also a walking example of the things that he said. And that was the critical factor. We're going to see him described in this record as a walking Bible. Ezra and the word of God became synonymous, inseparable. We're going to see the interchange between Ezra and the law. Because the word was made flesh in that man. 
Now, there are only three incidents in the 112 years of Ezra's life that are recorded in the Bible. Only three incidents. The first we found we find in Ezra 7 and 8. The second, Aaliyah, the going up from Babylon with the vessels for the temple. The second incident is when he gets to Jerusalem, he has to deal with the problem of the foreign wives. Ezra 9 and 10. The last incident is when he comes back to dedicate the walls. Nehemiah 8 and Nehemiah 12 cover that third incident. Let's just establish the history of the times. The first invasion, which took away Daniel, came in 606. 598, 597, bear in mind it was a long trip from Jerusalem to Babylon. Around that time we have the captivity of Jehoiachin. It takes away Ezekiel and his wife. 592, Ezekiel commences to prophesy. 586, the fall of Jerusalem. So from 606 of the first invasion, we now have the first Aaliyah, the decree of Cyrus, in 536. So there's your first 70. And bear in mind there were at least three 70-year periods. That's why some said in the days of Haggai, the time is not right. So the first 70 years has now gone by. The decree of Cyrus is issued. They can go back. It took 20 years to finish the temple. 20 years. Compare that to the 52 days to build the walls. And it took 20 years because of the opposition of the Samaritans and the Arabs, the change of heart back and forward in the, in the, in the kings of Persia. But it took 20 years to finish that work. And then in 514, Ezra leads up the second Aaliyah. Now, just a few facts that we can find about Ezra and himself. In the book of Ezra, the chapters 1 to 6 deal with the struggles of the first Aaliyah, that first 20 years. Building the temple against opposition. Chapters 4 and 6 absolutely sit right over the books of Haggai and Zechariah and the night visions of Zechariah particularly. Chapter 7 is about the king's commission. So it's the the speech or the, the writing of the king giving Ezra the task he had to do. It's quite remarkable the whole book of Ezra only contains 53 verses written by Ezra about himself. The last two verses of Ezra chapter 7, chapters 8 and 9, are the 53 verses that Ezra wrote about himself. And they are written in the first person. I did this, I did that. All the rest of it is written by somebody observing Ezra. So when you go to Ezra 10 verse 1, it says, and this Ezra did this. So it changes away from Ezra. There's only those 53 verses he writes about himself. Now Ezra was sent to Jerusalem. Come back to Ezra chapter 7. Just to show that contrast, if you look at verse Ezra chapter 9 verse 3, when I heard this thing, I did this. Chapter 10, verse 1, now when Ezra had prayed. So the record's gone into a different person. So when we come back to chapter 7, verse 8, we have the commission that was given by the king, Ahasuerus, to Ezra in the seventh year of his reign. Chapter 7 and verse 8, he came to Jerusalem in the fifth month and the seventh year of the king. So after a four-month journey, which started in the first month, so just after Passover, they arrive in Jerusalem in the seventh year of the king. So around that seventh year of the reign of Ahasuerus, Ezra is given this commission. Now what's significant about that? Well, that's the same year that Ahasuerus marries Esther. The temple in Jerusalem has been finished for two years, Esther 2 verse 16, and the influence of Esther and Mordecai are right through this commission that is given concerning Ezra the priest. It's the same year that Esther is now on the throne with the king. And when you read what this king has to say, you can see the influence of Mordecai and Esther coming through all, all through the writing of it. Now think about the commission that he was given. He was appointed by the king to coordinate and lead the second wave of captives, those who were willing to go back to Babylon. So again, we're now calling for volunteers. In verse 13 of this commission, I make a decree, says the king, and notice how specific this was. This is Mordecai of his priests and Levites. So this is really about getting teachers for the people. 
We don't need builders anymore. We need teachers, priests and Levites in my realm that are minded of their own free will to go to Jerusalem. We want volunteers to go and teach the people. And Ezra was required to coordinate this second exodus. And when he got back to revitalize the Jewish religion and to report back to the king on the spiritual progress of the nation. You just wonder, don't you, if Ezekiel might have been a very old man interested in this. He also had to take back all the remaining vessels of the house of God, which had been plundered by the Babylonians 70 years before. And he was given sweeping powers. Look in verse 21. Artaxerxes says, and I, Artaxerxes, make a decree to all the treasurers. Now, wouldn't you love this note in your hand? To go to Tom Coots and Tonus and say, look, we need a new ecclesial hall. Pay up. You know, he's got this ability to go and demand of them anything he needs for his work. He's got an open checkbook to the treasuries of the Persians. It just shows you the trust that was there. Just think about, and I haven't got time to look all these up, but I'll just tell you some of the things the king, king trusted him with. He put into his hand today's equivalent of $30 million in silver and gold. That's how much they carried. Today's equivalent of $30 million on the current price of gold. It was an enormous donation, as you read in verse 15. Because it wasn't just the vessels, it was, there was a, a donation of bullion that was also sent on this journey. In verse 25, you can appoint judges, Ezra, and judges that have the ability to apply the death penalty where necessary. You know, what an incredible thing for a king to give to a priest. You can appoint judges who can apply even up to the death penalty. But more than that, in verse 24, all of your teachers you take back are going to have tax-free status. They're exempted, in verse 25, from custom, verse 24 and 25. It will not be lawful to impose custom or tribute upon them. So they got tax-free status. As Levites, who depended on tithes, they would need that. Verse 25, what's the mission? At the end of verse 25, teach you them that know not. You've got to raise the spiritual level of the nation. Instruct them in God's law that they don't know it. You've got to make sure they do. You know, this is a king of Persia talking to a priest of Israel that the most important thing is not just carrying precious gold, it's getting people to understand the law of their God. And that's why when you read this, this, this writing of Artaxerxes, or Ahasuerus, the names are interchangeable, when you read this, it's so full of the influence of Mordecai and Esther. Now what do we know about this man Ezra? There's his family chronology. He's the brother of the high priest in the captivity in Babylon, Josedek. He's the uncle of the high priest in Jerusalem, Joshua. When he left Babylon on this journey that we read about in chapter 8, he was 80 years of age. 80 years of age. He might have lived to be about 112. Translated to the way that we live today, he'd probably be a 70-year-old setting off on this journey. A long journey, carrying lots of responsibility. Lots of worry. And later on, he came back at the age of 110 to dedicate the walls. Now, Ezra was both a Levite and a priest, but the record nine times calls him the scribe. And that was the thing that God really wanted us to notice about Israel. He was not so much a priest. He was a scribe. He was a teacher of the law. Now, the tribe of Levi had a unique role, and I'm sure that you've heard this so much from Uncle John, but they were God's gift to Israel. When God talks about the priests and the Levites, particularly the Levites, they were God's gift. I have given you the Levites, God says in Numbers chapter 8. Again and again, this is my gift to you, to ensure that education gets through. That's why God scattered the Levites all over the land, so that in every tribe, in every town, there were Levites to teach the law. And they were required to teach the knowledge of God. The priest's lips should keep knowledge. And the Levites had the same responsibility. So it says in verse 12 of Ezra 7, unto Ezra the priest, the scribe. Now look at the margin. To Ezra the priest, a perfect scribe in the law of God. So he wasn't just another Levite. He was the top scribe. This was the best scribe. A spiritual giant who could expound with great wisdom. No wonder... Mordecai and Esther said to the king, this is the man you need. Now, trace the incredible journey. Let's just go to Ezra 7. You know this story. So Ezra 7 and 8. 
Remember, he's 80 years old. A four-month journey has to be undertaken. They wait for the Passover and then off they go. 3,000 people, including children, volunteered to go. They took their possessions and their flocks and, they, and on this journey they averaged 12 miles a day. So some days they must have done more than that because they wouldn't have walked on the Sabbath. But it was an average of 12 miles a day. So let's say they covered 13 miles a day. Doesn't seem very far, does it? But you're trying to think you've got flocks and you've got little children and you've got all your possessions. It was a long four-month journey. They were carrying the vessels for the temple. They had bullion, probably in wagons. And they were going through very dangerous country. It was known for its bandits and its robbers. This is going from Babylon right up the Euphrates, crossing over up in Haran, coming right down through Syria, through the northern part of Israel to Jerusalem, full of Samaritans, full of Syrians. You know, in chapter 8 and verse 22, it says... The hand of our God is upon them that seek him. Why? Because in verse 22, the enemy in the way. In verse 31, he talks about those that lay in wait by the way. He was incredibly conscious, the fact that everybody knew how much wealth he was carrying and that he had refused an armoured guard. You think about that, brethren and sisters. What a prime target they were for plunderers. They had no armed guard because when they were offered troops by the king, Ezra said to the king, we have our God for protection, thank you very much. We don't need your armed guard. You know, they said that to the king in verse 22. The hand of our God is upon all them for good that seek him. The God of Israel will protect us. Now that's real faith, brethren and sisters, because then you have to live it, don't you? Then you've got to get to Jerusalem in a four-month journey. All they had for protection was the God of heaven. Now you imagine if we said here this morning, we're going to load up, we're going to get even 300 people, or let's say we had 3,000 people here. We're going to load you up with your possessions, so all of your worldly goods, so that's worth plundering. All of your children who could be sold as slaves, that's worth plundering. All your flocks, which are worth plundering. And $30 million of gold and silver bullion. And you're going to walk to Sydney. And you won't have any guards, I'm sorry about that. Only your faith. You know, we wouldn't get past Deverin Park, would we? We wouldn't make it to Gawler. They'd all be waiting for us all the way through Jeb's Cross. Because everybody knows you've got it. I mean, this is a public thing. All the vessels are brought out and given and put in wagons. You know, this is an incredible act of faith, isn't it? And our journey to the kingdom is equally perilous, brethren and sisters, and we're carrying precious vessels intended for the house of God. Now, in chapter 8 and verse 20, 24 to 34, if you haven't done this, colour in the word vessels. It's there eight, uh, sorry, six times. Vessels, vessels, vessels. When you go back to chapter 1, between verse 6 and 11, you find the same focus on vessels in the first earlier. Vessels, vessels, and four times you've got it in chapter 1. So on both these returns, there was a great focus upon the vessels that were being carried. Now come back to 829, and this is what they had to do with these vessels. In verse 29, watch ye and keep them until you weigh them before the priest in Jerusalem. That is what we are doing, brethren and sisters, for each other. We're keeping each other in the way, and we watch over each other until we are weighed before the judge in Jerusalem. And when they got there in verse 33, the first thing they did, they weighed in the vessels of the house of God. It was not so important about the bullion. What really mattered was those vessels. Everyone had to be accounted for. Verse 34, by number and by weight, everyone was accounted for. So what are vessels today? Well, you know the answer to that. Vessels represent people. It says in the 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 6 and 7, God hath put the light or the knowledge of the glory of God and we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency may be of God and not of us. We have this treasure of God's knowledge and God's glory in earthen vessels today. Peter called our sisters the weaker vessel, physically more fragile, but the divine contents are absolutely the same. 
We are all equal receptacles of God's glory. Some are more beautiful and fragile than some of us men. But the contents are exactly the same. Now vessels, if they've got nothing in them, they just make a lot of noise. Vessels can be very beautiful as those that are serving kings. Some are very functional like the saucepans in your kitchen. And some are used for unclean things such as rubbish bins. The kind of vessel you are is your choice. This is the ESV for 2 Timothy chapter 2. Now in a great house, which is God's house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but of wood and clay. Some for honourable and some for dishonourable. So we know that there's a whole range of quality of vessels. Therefore, and here's the, the onus on us, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonourable, You've got to get out of your vessel anything. You've got to throw out the cockroaches and be suitable for God to put his glory in there. If it's full of rubbish, the glory of God will not go there. You've got to cleanse yourself and be a vessel for honourable use, set apart as wholly useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. So God can use you if you choose to be a clean vessel. How do you do that? Well, you cut off the flesh, you flee youthful passions, and you pursue righteousness. Faith and love and peace. And you need help to do that. It's not easy on your own. You've got to find companions in the truth with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. And we say to our young people, particularly those that are thinking about courting, when you find somebody you think you're interested in, go wait right past the what you see with your eyes. Can you talk about the Bible? Can you pray together? Do you have a connection on a spiritual wavelength with them? And same for your friends. You choose your friends, young people, from those who love the things that you love in the Bible. Bad company corrupts good manners. It doesn't mean we don't try and help those who are struggling. But it means that we get our strength from our friends that are going in the same direction. So determined to be a cleansed, holy vessel that God can fill. Every vessel had to be accounted for, and so will it be. When we come to the house of God in Jerusalem, every vessel, we hope, will have been accounted for. Now the Bible says a lot about vessels, and we've, we've put these up before. The house of David. You know, Jesus will be the linchpin upon which all the vessels that have come to the house of God will be hung on. We will be there because Christ is a nail fastened in a firm place. So I'll hang upon him all the glory of the Father's house and all vessels of small quantity. It doesn't matter how your little pot of oil, how small it is, brethren and sisters, it will be there with the Lord Jesus Christ. Vessels of cups to vessels of flagons. The small and the great. God has got all of his people hanging on Christ in the kingdom. And finally, the same language is used in Zechariah 14 about the cleansing of all people. And when they come to Jerusalem to worship, every vessel will be holy, says God. So vessels are a theme, aren't they, of this chapter? So let's go back to Ezra chapter 8 and trace the journey to Zion we're all making with the vessels of which we all are. It's a difficult journey. The enemy is in the way. There are people laying in wait. Amalek is still waiting to ambush and destroy God's people, especially when you don't keep close to the ecclesia. The evil world will steal your mind, your bodies and your hearts. If you want a really depressing experience, brethren and sisters, get out an old conference photograph from the 60s or 70s, those who were there. Well, those of you who are younger, get out one from 20 years ago, 10 years ago, and count the gaps. Think of the stories of whether some of those people that you once knew well have ended up. I've stopped doing it. It depresses me. We have to do everything we can to make sure every vessel reaches Jerusalem and finds a permanent home in God's house. So what calibre of man did God choose to bring the vessels to Zion? Chapter 7, verse 6. Let's just examine his qualifications. Chapter 7, verse 6. This Ezra went up from Babylon. He was a ready scribe. You know, that's a beautiful word to put in front of a man's name. It means in the Hebrew, quick and skillful. 
It means to flow easily. It only occurs four times in the whole Old Testament. Psalm 45, verse 1, my tongue is the pen of a ready writer. Somebody who knows this topic back to front, you can hardly get the pen going fast enough because he doesn't have to think between sentences. It's just, it's just coming out. He's flowing because it's just, his heart's full of it. Proverbs 22, verse 20, 29, a man diligent in business, he shall stand before kings. So somebody who's skillful and willing and intelligent, like Ezra was, will stand before kings. What have we got here? A king's commission. Isaiah 16, verse 5, hasten righteousness. Talking about how Jesus will make sure the world is, sees God's righteousness. He will take wicked, wickedness away from the earth. He will bring in an age of righteousness and peace. The work of righteousness shall be peace. And he will hasten that. It will flow quickly from Armageddon to education. So he's a ready scribe in the law of Moses. Look at verse 12. He is, as the margin said, a perfect scribe. He knew the scriptures. He wrote them out. He studied and marked his Bible. All scholars attribute the compilation of the Hebrew scriptures down to that time, the compilation of putting together the books of Moses, the prophets, the kings, the chronicles, the judges. All scholars attribute the work of putting the Bible together up to this time as the work of Ezra. And the fact that it's his greatest work, they say. Not only that he collected the words that were the words of God that God wanted preserved, but he kept out of the scriptural canon all the non-inspired writings that God did not want included. And that spirit of, of dividing between what, was, what God had said and what men had said carried right down through the scribes, and that's why the Apocrypha is not part of God's revelation. That was Jewish fables. And it was the spirit of Ezra where you say, this is God's word and that's the opinions of men. It's why in the Apocrypha you find wrong doctrine. Ezra was the one who set the, the, the pattern for saying, this is scripture and that is not. And so God's hand was with him. You know, verse 10, sorry, verse 9 says, the end of it, according to the good hand of his God upon him. God's hand was heavily on the life of Ezra. But... How is it that God can work with us? You know, Brother Robert says, human action is the basis of divine supervision. And so it is. Look at verse 10. Because we explain why God's hand was upon him. Four starts off verse 10. That's why God's hand was upon him. He had made certain decisions that enabled God to work mightily in his life. What had he done? Well, he prepared his heart to seek. So the first thing he does is he gets his priorities right. I am going to prepare my heart... I'm going to make a firm decision. I want to go this way. So how do I know the way? Well, I seek. I study the law of God. I seek the law of Yahweh. You know, Paul says, study to show thyself approved. Give diligence to show thyself approved under God, rightly dividing the word of truth. You know, we need to be able to split the word and to say it means that and not that. It means diligent application. So he prepared. He made a decision on priorities. He studied the word of God and then he practiced it, to do it. And we must lead by personal example as well as by teaching. All too sadly, our community has witnessed how destructive it can be when there's a disconnect between exposition and practice. And you all know what I'm talking about. It's a tragedy for the community when there's a disconnect between exposition and practice. And then, having learned to do it, he then says, now I can teach it. Statutes and judgments. When we've grounded ourselves in divine knowledge, when we've learned to walk in divine ways, then we are fitted to teach. If the walk is not consistent, no one's going to listen. But he was also a man of prayer. You come to the end of chapter 7. Now, on my favourite theme of chapter divisions are often in the wrong place, the last two verses of chapter 7 should be part of chapter 8 because chapter 7 is the king's commission. Chapter 8 is Ezra's prayer of thanks for the commission and request for God's help on the journey that he's about to take. It should be part of chapter 8. 
but he's a prayerful man. He's not inflated by the king's opinion of himself. All the tremendous, you know, the tax-free status, I can appoint judges that can apply the death penalty. I can requisition anything I want. He's not, he's not inflated by that. He thanks God to put into the king's heart to beautify the house in Jerusalem. And don't we want to do that, brethren and sisters? We want to put living stones and gems into God's house. And he's given me mercy before the king and his counsellors and the mighty princes. And I was strengthened because the hand of God was upon me. And so I go and create the second Aaliyah. And the word there in verse, the end of verse 28, to go up is Aaliyah. The second Aaliyah is about to get going. Now remember, he's refused the armed escort. That was a big thing. You know, in the truth, we often have a public profession of faith. We are conscientious objectors. But if you're an 18-year-old facing two days in court, like my older brother was, as the first Christadelphian in this state in the Vietnam War to be called up, all your professions are very hard to put into practice. Do you know, in my father's 90-year lifetime, that was the only night before that trial that I saw my father cry with concern. Because on Jim's shoulders rested the Christadelphian case for the first time since the Second World War. <coughs> Professions are easy. When you start the journey, it's always not such a comfortable thing. They knew the bandits were there. And I love to think of how, what a great time in the next four months the angels had frustrating bandits. So nobody got to touch them in four months. You just think of it. Just, just let your mind run on that. What a glorious time the angels had frustrating bandits all the way on that four-month journey. But Ezra wasn't unconscious of the danger. And when he gets to Jerusalem in verse 31, God had delivered us from the hand of the enemy and such as lay in wait. And he knew that he'd been delivered. But only then did he stop worrying. Now his greatest example was the focus on spiritual wisdom. The word of God is a sharp two-edged sword, living and energetic, dividing asunder flesh and spirit. We need to be skillful in the word of righteousness. All right. I'm terrible at this. I'm always getting so far behind my slides. This is the ESV of Hebrews chapter 5. Solid food is for the mature. For those who have the powers of discernment, trained by constant practice to distinguish between good and evil. You know, Weymouth has for verse 14... Solid food is for adults, that is, for those who through constant practice have their spiritual faculties carefully trained to distinguish good from evil. So when we are fully engaged in understanding the Bible, we have very heightened sensitivity between good and evil. Remember the words of Jeremiah? The word of God is like a fire, like a hammer that breaketh in pieces. We must develop that perception that comes from divine thinking. You know, the words of Philippians chapter 1, which again is Weymouth, it is my prayer that your love may be more and more accompanied. There's lots of Christadelphians that talk about love, brethren and sisters, till it makes you almost sick. By clear knowledge and keen perception for testing things that differ. If you've got, so you've got love, then you should have that keen perception to test between things that differ. That you might be men of transparent character, blameless, preparation for the day of Christ. Filled like vessels with the glory of God. If we don't have that keen perception, we can't show love. We just end up another another church. And Ezra's mission was to get that perception into their hearts. They needed teachers in the law. Teach them that know not, said the king. So now he's looking for teachers. Remember, Levites, priests, Please volunteer to go with Ezra. So we come to chapter 8. Look what happened. Verse 15. They'd agreed on a meeting point outside the city, the river Ahava. Verse 15. I gathered together the river that runneth to Ahava, and there abode we in tents three days while I inspected the people. And the word there, viewed, means to separate mentally. I went around and I said, who are you? Where do you come from? What's your background? And he went around and he interviewed the whole a lot of the men, particularly, that were there. 
And there's a great tragedy, brethren and sisters. There were no Levites. So he said to the 3,000, pitch your tents. We are not going one step further without any Levites. Now you think about it. Why had no Levites responded? Well, with 70 years in Babylon, the good Levites had already gone in the first Aaliyah. Joshua and all those sort of people had gone. But now in Babylon, they've got houses and they've got vineyards. They've got lands and businesses because there were no tithes, no temple in Babylon that they could live on. So they had to set up their own businesses and farms. That's what they were told to do by Jeremiah. Who wants to go back to a poor, desolated land where there are going to be very few tithes available because there's no inheritance, there's no farmland there for them? Who wants to go if you're a Levite? Go back to that. Look what Ezra does. He picks out from the 3,000 a bunch of heavyweights. And a hit list is drawn up. Who do we really want? And back they go. No more of this volunteer stuff. In verse 16, I sent for Eliezer and Aaron and Shemaiah and El Nathan. You know, a sister pointed out to me recently that there's four Nathans in this verse. And you look at Nathan, you know, it's, it's an interesting look at the meaning of the word Nathan. I'll leave you to follow that one through. But there are four Nathans in this verse. And he said, right, you guys back into Babylon and work on this hit list. I want you and you and you. And I sent them back to Ido, the chief at the palace, all right, so this is the man back in the palace, to say to them that they should bring unto us ministers for the house of God. So we also want nethanims. We want people to serve the temple in the practical capacity. And look at the response. In verse 38, there's eventually 38 Levites respond. Now among them were two men. Now, you need to make a correction in verse 18 in your Bible where it says, they brought a man of the sons of Marli, the son of Levi, the son of Israel, and Sherebiah. The word and is wrong. It should be even Sherebiah, as the ESV has. So we're talking about this man called Sherebiah. And in verse 24, you've got a man called Hashabiah. They were totally trustworthy men. They were on the hit list, and there were 220 nethanims in verse 20. 20. They were the Gibeonites. They were those that had become the faithful servants of the temple. They did the practical operations of the temple. Now, this Sherebiah is described in verse 18 as a, might, a man of discretion. Sherebiah with his sons, 18, a man of understanding, a man of discretion. The NIV has a mighty man of intelligence. When we get back to Nehemiah chapter 8, and Nehemiah is reading the law, and the Levites have to teach the people what it means... Sherebiah's there. And you'll find him in Nehemiah chapter 8. It, Nehemiah, Ezra knew that without sound leadership, without understanding of the law, they were doomed. Chapter 9, when he gets back to Jerusalem, the Levites in Jerusalem have already failed badly and have let people marry to foreign wives, including many of the Levites had done that. So they needed men who could come from outside and say, this is not right. We're going to take over this failed priesthood in Jerusalem. And Ezra has to go back to Babylon and report to the king and to leave these people in charge. The great strength of our Christadelphian community is that every individual is encouraged to be a personal Bible student, male and female. We don't rely upon a highly trained reverend divine with a theology degree to tell us what to believe and what the Bible says. Every one of you needs to read and to get the Bible for ourselves. But there is a time to say that we need people who can teach. You know what Paul said in Timothy? Those that labour in the word and doctrine need to be encouraged. And it's true, brethren and sisters, we do need people who've been given by God the ability to help us understand the word. And we need to value them. Not that we put them on pedestals and make them worship them, but to value the fact that they exist and to encourage them in the work that they should do that for us. And so the journey made its way with 38 Levites and 220 Nethanims added to the company. And they got to Jerusalem and not one vessel was lost in the journey. Now in chapter 9 of Ezra we have the second incident. I'm just going to do it very quickly because you know the story. Having delivered the vessels and the gold, Ezra now hears that many of the Levites, the princes and the rulers, have married Canaanites. Canaanites. 
And we're now serving their abominations. You read verse 1 to 3, they're actually now serving the gods of these people. And that's what happens when you marry Canaanites. Ezra was stunned by this. You could not have imagined this was what happening in Jerusalem. He was stunned. The temple's only been finished two years. And he goes into deep mourning for a whole day in verse 3. There was a day of universal weeping. Ezra's crying and pulling out his own hair. The people wept after his prayer in chapter 10. Now, when Ezra had prayed and when he'd confessed, weeping and casting down, the people wept very sore. And over in chapter 10, verse 9, God's weeping because he deluged them with rain. And everybody's crying their eyes out. And then Ezra offers this magnificent prayer that goes through the most of chapter 9. And it's a reflection of the prayer of Daniel in Daniel chapter 9. Good exercise. Go to Daniel 9 and colour in the we and us and the inclusive terms and the ours in Daniel 9 and colour them through here from verse 6 down to the end of the chapter. You will be amazed at the similarity of thought and the fact that both Daniel and Ezra include themselves in a confession of wickedness. They don't stand apart and say, this rotten people, we have done this, our sins, our faults. And God, you gave us a nail You've recreated us in our own land and you've got a little nail we can hang on to and we've let you down. And the prayer is full of gratitude and confession. Ezra had not said a word to the people and now they're crying their eyes out because of his prayer. Now chapter 9 verse 12, I just want to pick up one point from his prayer. Why was this issue so terribly grief stricken for Ezra? Well it says, the end of verse 12, the inheritance is at stake. You mix with Canaanites, the inheritance is at stake. And that's what comes by intermarriage with the world. It was the issue in the days of Noah. The sons of God married the daughters of men. And even today, brethren and sisters, less and less of our number see marriage only in the Lord as a critical commandment. Less ecclesias are taking action when people marry out of the truth. And yet it's in their constitution that that's a fellowship issue. But they do nothing. They mightn't approve. They might try and talk people out, but they do nothing. See, that's the point of, this, of these two chapters. You can mourn and weep and say, I hate to see it happen. But look what Ezra does in chapter 10. You see, today it's all about human need. What do these people need? You know, they are humans. They need to be happy, don't they? They need to be happy. Well, I think this is going to be one of our next issues we have to face. Can I also say at the same time that as ecclesias and as individuals, we need to honour those brethren and sisters who have remained single for the kingdom of heaven's sake. Let's not regard them with pity. Let's honour them as Paul did. They have dedicated themselves to the service of the Lord above everything else. And make sure that when we provide activities that they don't feel left out. Many of you arranging these sort of activities have got little children and rightly so you provide for them. That's wonderful. But think of those who are single, who may never have children, but who dedicate themselves to the truth and honour them, brethren and sisters, for the choice they have made to obey what God says. And tell them that you honour them for that. They need to be encouraged in that stand. Don't sit around talking about, oh, poor so-and-so can't find someone. It's got nothing to do with it. They're obeying God and waiting to see if God provides. And it may not happen. So when Ezra had prayed humbly to God, he took dramatic action in chapter 10. He said, we're going to make a covenant to reverse this problem. You see... Plenty of people will wring their hands and say it's terrible. But when you're faced with a situation so desperately grievous for the inheritance as this one, something has to be done. And they made a covenant to put away their strange wives. Now you think of the social dislocation and the heartbreak that would have caused. But Ezra said, it has to be done. You see, that's a different picture of what the world would say. That's completely ridiculous to do something like that. If you're going to save the inheritance, 
something has to be done. Let's come to Nehemiah 8, the last scene in the life of this great man, Ezra. Nehemiah 8 and 12 are the two chapters where Ezra reappears at the dedication of the wall. He'd gone back after the first Aaliyah to report to the king. 27 years later, he comes back. And he's now between 107 and 110. There is here the most wonderful phrase in Nehemiah chapter 8, where it says there in verse 5, when he stands up to read the law, I want you to notice your margin, in the eyes of all the people. Later on, a man would come and stand in the synagogue in Jerusalem and read the word of God in such a way that every eye in the synagogue was fastened on him. And here's a similar reading, brethren and sisters. In the eyes of the people, when Ezra stood up and opened the book, everybody stood up. And they stood up for four hours. In verse 3, from the, from the morning, which in the margin has, from the time that the sun rose until midday. So four or five hours, they stand up to hear the word of God read publicly. After Ezra read certain passages, the Levites would gather small groups around and they would break it small for them. Verse 8 talks about these Levites in verse 7. Jeshua, probably Joshua, Bani, and who's this guy? Sherebiah, here he is. They caused the people to understand the law and the people stood in their place. So they got in little groups around a Levite and said, now what Israel really means for that? Was, and they, they explained the law. They would have all been taught by Israel. So they read in the, Lord, in the book of God the Lord distinctly. And they gave the sense. This is what it means. And they caused them to understand the reading. So this went on for five to six hours. And the people are standing up out of respect for Ezra. Do you like to stand up for six hours and listen to the word of God? You know, we complain if the speaker goes five minutes over time. I've just created 10 minutes for myself. But notice the synergy and the parallels between Ezra and the word of God. If you haven't got these coloured in, colour them in, brethren and sisters. In 8 verse 2 or 8 verse 1, they spake to Ezra the scribe to bring the book. So here's a walking Bible. Ezra and the book in verse 1. In verse 2, Ezra the priest brought the law. The end of verse 3, unto the book of the law and Ezra the scribe. At the start of verse 4. In verse 5, Ezra opened the book. In verse 6, when he opened the book, all the people stood up. The end of verse 9, they heard the words of the law. Then he said, just assume who this is in verse 9. You know it's Ezra. If the Bible's open, Ezra's there reading it. The end of verse 12, they understood the, the words of the law that were declared under them by Ezra. Verse 13, unto Ezra to understand the words of the law. In verse 18, he read in the book of the law. Again, no name needed there. Everybody knows he's going to read this because he's a walking Bible. And that, brethren and sisters, is something that was marvellous about Ezra. Now, how did the people respond once they understood the message? Well, they were sad. There was weeping and there was repentance at the end of verse 9. They wept when they heard the words of the law. It was also a day they were encouraged to send gifts to the poor. And Ezra and the Levites had to say to these people, look, I know why you're mourning. I know why you're sad. Now you understand how far you've departed from the law. And that's what the word of God should do to us when we first hear it. We realize how far we fall short of what God really wants us to be. But God says, don't stay in that condition. And look at the words of verse 10. Don't be sorry. For the joy of Yahweh is your strength. You have to go past the feeling of your inadequacy. I'll come back to that later. Look what happened the next day, the second day in verse 13. So after the day of reading and conversations and explanations, the next day there's a self-generated Bible class. So some of these people that have heard it said, we need more of this. Do you know, I love to hear when our young people get together and study for Hebron. They don't have to do that. 
Or when they have little Bible classes to get together and say, we need to do more than just go to Wednesday night. I love to hear that. And here's a self-generated Bible class. The chief of the fathers, the priests, the Levites, and they come to Ezra with a suggestion. They said, we have just read about the keeping of the Feast of Tabernacles. Wouldn't it be wonderful to redo that? Well, they kept the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, it was the seventh month that they kept it in, but it was a week early. Is God going to send down fire from heaven because they're keeping the Feast of Tabernacles a week early? No, they said, we want to do it right now. We are so motivated by what we've read, we want to do it right now. And it was a joyous day with great gladness. Look at verse 17. And all the congregation came again and made booze. And there was very great gladness, says verse 17. And there's an unusual statement in verse 17. It says, hasn't been done since the days of Joshua. Well, it had been done almost every year until the captivity. So what does that mean? There never was any of the children of Israel since the day they came out of Egypt that could keep the Feast of Tabernacles like these people because they had also come out of a great captivity rescued by the hand of God and given back their land. And they understood what it was to think about those who came out of Egypt. No one had ever kept it with such dedication and joyfulness as these people. They empathised totally with the coming out of Egypt. So though the tabernacles had been kept, it had never been kept with such sincerity as this lot kept it. Now, when you go back and look at the Feast of Tabernacles in Leviticus, it tells you the type of trees that they used to pluck to make their booths from. We find here there's a new tree being added to the list. A new specification. And it says in verse 15, olive branches, pine branches, and myrtle branches. There's the new tree. What are they celebrating by adding myrtles to the Feast of Tabernacles? Well, over there in the throne of Persia where all these decrees have come from to give them a nail in God's holy place, to drive off the Samaritans, to provide Ezra's. There is on the throne of Persia, Hadassah, the myrtle, enthroned. And you go to Zechariah chapter 1 verse 8, which is at the same time period, and the encouragement they were given in Zechariah 1 verse 8 is the Yahweh angel sits in the shade of the myrtle tree. I will provide Esther, God is prophesying to Zechariah, I will provide a myrtle tree under which you will be protected. And the decree of Ezra that he should do this was influenced by the new queen on the throne. And now they lived under the shadow and protection of the throne of Persia. And so they celebrated under myrtle branches for the first time in their history. I think that's beautiful, brethren and sisters. Hadassah being the Hebrew name of Esther. In verse 18, they finished the Feast of Tabernacles with another reading from the law. And would we love to hear Ezra read like this? Day by day. So the whole of the Feast of Tabernacles, Ezra is repeating reading from the Bible. He read. No need to say who it was. We all know who's reading this. He read in the book of the law of God. And they kept it, and it was a solemn assembly. Ezra and the law of God were synonymous. Now, the last glimpse of Ezra is the ceremonial procession of the walls in chapter 7. A wonderful procession, music, singing, happiness, two groups going in opposite directions, singers, joyfulness, so symbolic of the day when the saints in Christ shall come into the temple by the way of the east. A time of happiness. So we won't go there because that's another topic. I want to just summarise, brethren and sisters, on the lessons that we trust we've learnt from Ezra the Ready Scribe. Every one of us needs to become an individual Bible student to get that discernment between good and evil, to rightly divide the word of truth, to have that keen spiritual perception of what's right or wrong, we have to start with that. 
We must decide to be Levites in Israel. You'd make the decision, you commit, I want to be a Levite. You then seek the law of God. You then learn to live it as best you can. You won't be perfect, but you learn to live it. Then you sanctify your vessels to say, we want to be useful in God's house. We then pick up our brethren and sisters and we carry vessels to Zion, trying to ensure that none are lost. And we pray for God's help and thank him for his guidance. We value the spiritual guides that God has given us. The transmission of knowledge in the community is essential. If we don't have that, and we all learn from past generations, I can give you a list of, of, of dozens of faithful brethren that have taught me so much. And incredibly, I've probably learnt more from sisters who very quietly come up after the talk and say, look, I look at it this way. I never thought of it like that. <laughs> so sisters, don't be frightened to pass on your wisdom. Let us hold fast to marriage being only in the, in the Lord. Let us reflect upon Ezra's amazing exhortation in chapter 8 and verse 10. I want you to just end up there, brethren and sisters. This is a glorious statement. And I trust as we go away from this weekend that we will take this with us. We are rightly chastened at times by the word of God. It does cut deep between soulish and spiritual. It is a sharp sword. It hurts. When we come to the Lord's table and we face the example of our Lord Jesus Christ and we think about our own life in the last week, it hurts that we've let him down. We realise how much we need God's forgiveness. We hate our sinfulness. But God says to us through Ezra, when you come here, yes, it's good to be chastened. But I want you to come here to feel encouraged and uplifted. And brethren and sisters, when we think about what God has achieved in Christ, what God has promised to us who deserve none of it, we can go away rejoicing in the fact that we know our hope is sure, that we have a better resurrection, that we will meet, like Ezekiel, we will meet those we have loved again in the kingdom. And we thank God for the rejoicing of kindred spirits in the truth. Let us, brethren and sisters, go away this weekend with this exhortation ringing in our ears. Let the joy of Yahweh be your strength.